Off the Cuff is sponsored by Alencom and Republic. Hey guys, welcome back. This is Alex Salas, and we're here in another episode of ATD CFL Off the Cuff. This is a, this is the first triple threat we got. We got two guests, not just one. So you get uh, you get better value today. You get two guests for the price of what nothing because we never we don't charge anything. But in any event, if you ever heard about how you track your learning, then you probably heard about SCORM, sure. And I will explain that to, to the newbies out there. Uh, sure, we'll content up your reference model, which is basically communicating completions, quiz scores, all that good stuff. And if you're savvy enough, you're doing 2004 and you're getting item level interactions and all that good jazz. However, today's talk is not about SCORM. But this guy's right here have been involved in scoring one way or another, especially this one guy that I have here at the bottom. If he's, hopefully he's still at the bottom when we show this. But we got today folks that have been involved since the beginning of SCORM and are also now involved with XAPI. Today's talk is about XAPI. So it is my pleasure to introduce Rob Chadwick and Jason Hag. Hey, thanks for having us, Alex. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for joining me. So today what we're doing, as we discussed, we're going off the cuff. We know no scripts, anything like that. We're going to talk a little bit about, okay, XAPI was the big deal, why people should care, all that good stuff. And uh, the first thing is I gotta, I, I, I'm going to come, and I'm going to be challenging on this one, right? I'm going to be the, the bad guy on this talk, and you guys come back and tell us what you think. But uh, first of all, I, I think we need to – start telling people to stop calling it a uh, tin can API, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that the whole name uh, moniker, I think that was, uh, you know, that was good to get it started. And that was uh, something that was done out of, uh, you know, AD XAPI's history as a research project through the ADL initiative. When Rob and I were both there, uh, they, the ADL initiative uh, funded through a contract, uh, Rusticy software. And they're really good at uh, getting a community together uh, they nicknamed the project Tin Can, and therefore the output of that project was the Tin Can API. Um, when uh, XAPI became a 1.0 version, that's when the, the name shift really started to set in. I think it was around 2012 or 2013, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So essentially, if we're talking here again, for the newbies out there, Experience API. If you ever heard of an API, it's something that allows software pretty much talk to each other, applications that are allowed to talk to each other, just in those application programming interface, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Check me on, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, but, um, you know, the way I explain it to people is, yeah, they're basically the same thing. I mean, technically, Tin Can is like XAPI 0 0.9, you know? Right. Close enough, it's not exactly accurate, but close right. enough for everybody, you know? But for the sake of speaking the same language, let's just say XAPI from now on. Yeah. I still see people writing blogs out there and call it Think and API. Well, so, and, and the reason that is, is because some authoring tools still only support 0 0.9. Oh. Uh, so this is a, this is an off the cuff call out to you authoring tools out there. Get with it, update yeah. your support and support the latest version. Of, uh, yeah, 0.9 uh, yeah. is old. It's, it's called, tools, it's yeah. called Tin Can inside of the authoring tools. So naturally, you know, some developers are still going to call it that. It's not their fault. Yeah. True that. I, I agree. It's a good one. I, I endorse that message. So what's the big deal, guys? Why should people care about doing XAPI? Let me, let me take that one, Jason. Um, sure. So, okay. Uh, you know, people talk like XAPI is magic and it solves like every problem ever, right? It's not, right? But what it does do is it solves a very specific problem, which for some people is a real issue. Right. Not everybody. I mean, maybe this is blasphemy. Right. But not everything is made better by XAPI. Right. But for content that lives on a Web page that is not delivered from an LMS, which is look, a lot of people want to like publish a storyline course and just put it on a file server and send people to it. Right. Without an LMS, you can't get data back from that thing. Now, you could make up some kind of some kind of technology to do it. Right. But why would you make up technology when you could use some kind of interoperable standard? That's what XAPI is for. I mean, it's a primary use case is, is tracking user experience and content that is not LMS delivered. 
That's right. Anything outside of the anything outside of the browser and outside of the LMS is what it really enables. And if you go back um, to 2008 is uh, when ADL started this initiative called Letsy, and their focus was defining the requirements for the next generation of SCORM or SCORM 2.0. And XAPI was really born out of those requirements. And it was the requirement to have interoperable tracking of any type of learning experience across any platform, any device. And that's, that's, that's where it was born out of is, was an old requirement from then. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah. 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 Let me weigh in with another, another big point. Um, uh, a, a selling point that is often overlooked in XAPI is, you know, the old SCORM data model simply includes no standardized API definitions for retrieving data, right? Like the, the LMS vendor is totally free to lock you into their data silo with data that can never be exfiltrated in any way, right? And it's in their interest to do so, right? But you can't be conformant to XAPI without publishing a query interface, which can be used to retrieve all of the data. So that's one of the kind of big deals, right? Is like, you can't be XAPI and also sort of lock the data into your system so it can never be exported. That wouldn't be conformant. All right, so let's talk business sense because obviously, you know, we can talk techie all day, but the main thing is, look, right now you're using SCORM and you're probably not even going past 1.2. So the only thing you can tell people is that people are taking a course and they're passing a quiz or something. So how does that allow you to evaluate anything in learning? And I'm talking to all of you, learning leaders, strategists out there managing a, a learning and development function. Now, let's fast forward, let's go to XAPI. The big value, big, big, huge value there is that it's, it's anything you can make it in an interaction level uh, measuring that you can do, right? I mean, so we're talking about stuff that you can actually measure, you know, specific interactions and you can really go into more detail if you need to whatever it is the business need is, is in play, right? But it allows you to tell more than just, you know, it allows you to tell a full story, right? A fuller story of what happened and how people are performing rather than just saying, well, yeah, we did a course, they took a course and they passed. It. Is that right? Am I wrong? No, you're right. You're right. I mean, uh, the, the XAPA data model includes a mechanism for you to sort of specify arbitrary events, right? It doesn't have to be passed a course. It doesn't have to be answered a question. It can be anything. And, and that's like, that's, that's both the beauty and, and the biggest problem with XAPI, right? Is it could be anything. So, I mean, people do things like tracking clicks. They do heat maps with like where the mouse is. I don't think that's a great idea personally, but people are interested in that stuff. Um, People use XAPI for tracking interactions with video, like where have you seeked to, when did you pause it, that kind of thing. Right. Right. Um, well, you're not going to go, I mean, you know, as a business uh, L&D function, you're not going to go from not measuring anything to then going and measuring heat maps. I mean, it's like a big ass, big jump. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean. <laughs> <It's> my French. <laughs> um, but, yeah. but, I mean, you know, but here's the thing, guys. I, I've dealt a little bit with XAPI. I played in the cohorts, the Megan Torrens, and you know, company has been put in play, and that's what I saw. I got to see uh, Jason uh, digitally, per se, right? So here's the biggest thing, though. It almost feels like, to me, it's like you're still, you're using the same mechanisms by which you use web analytics, right? And XAPI is your dictionary of Yeah, sorts. it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar to web analytics, yeah. Right. So, I mean, I'm saying instead of me, click, you know, analyzing click throughs and conversions and whatever, now I'm, I'm able to put some meaning to whatever I'm tracking. Right. So, oh, you did the drag and drop interaction. That was the drag and drop because you know now that where to grab the ax or where to, you know, do this or where to do that. Right. So, I mean, in that perspective, it's nothing new in terms of the transmission mechanism. Mm -hmm. But what is new is that you're given a meaning by having something that two applications can now communicate and say, this is the same meaning, right? Yeah, they did this. Yes, I know what you mean. And now we can send it to another LRS or we can send it to the LMS or is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah, but you've you've really hit on on both the beauty and and the kind of issue, right? Which is two applications understand each other. Right. right. Now I'm going to give you a little background because here's the interesting part. All right, hit me. I worked back in the day with a software company, and they work with this uh, uh, interface uh, that they use in healthcare. It's called HL7, right? You probably yep. heard about it. Health level yep. seven. Familiar. Right. Yep. So, Great, great concept, right? Hey, you know, let's uh, put a machine out there with medications. People dispense stuff. We use a little IoT action and, uh, you know, send the message back to the counting software, pharmacy software, and, you know, it gives you the info, and it's all HL7. We can identify patients, patient info, doc info, all that stuff, right? Same nightmare, I think, happens here with HCPI. The nightmare is that you got a bunch of vendors out there and nobody wants to play by the same rules. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm, and right, that's, that's one of the big issues in the, in the whole kind of industry at the moment, right, is uh, people modeling the same types of interactions in different ways that both fit into the API, right? Mm. I mean, mm. I've, I've had people do... Um, <clears throat> What's the one I'm always bitching about, Jason? Um, the the choice, like imagine a multiple choice question, right? Uh -huh. Okay. The choice got chosen. So the kind of like identifier in this activity stream, the object is the choice. It's not the question. <clears throat> right? It's not the quiz. It's the choice, right? Um, and then other people model it as the question got answered, and the answer was whatever that choice was. Like, dude, this is – that's semantically the same thing, but yeah, it can be yeah. represented in two different ways, and that makes my head kind of explode, right? Right, and that's mm -hmm. not the uh, the vendors, the LRS vendors. What we what, what we have right now is a real problem in terms of learning record providers following things in a semantically interoperable way. Um, unfortunately, XAPI, when it first started, we had to get everything out and get a lot of innovative uh, approaches so we didn't focus a lot on the vocabulary and semantic interoperability. Um, ADL just released a specification that focuses on profiles just, uh, what, two and a half years ago. It kind of was late to the game. So that was kind of the problem. It was also, you know, we, we, I don't think we would have gotten the adoption of XAPI as we did if we waited around for that because it took several years just to get the, the profile stuff right, several years, and it's still not done. There still needs. There's still a need for a validation tool, uh, profile okay. server, okay. and some other things that are in the spec. Not to get too geeky, but mm -hmm. what you're touching on, Alex, is really important here, and it's that uh, and what Rob is talking about. To do things in a real interoperable way, vendors should be looking at things that have already been created that follow a specific profile. Now, a profile is how to do things in a consistent, standard way. It's kind of like a blueprint for success is the term right. I use. So, well, uh, for, one, my, for one, my number seven at the Burger King joint, right? I know yeah. what the number seven is, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, the video example you gave earlier, uh, Rob was talking to, there's a video profile out there. You want to track videos? We've got a standard way of doing it. If you do deviate from that and you find out your LRS cannot display your data or help you visualize it in a certain graph, it's because you didn't follow the profile. Um, so, so yeah. yeah, let me follow up on that, right? Because Jason, you're exactly right. And, and I mean, look, this is, where the this is where the conversation usually goes as kind of what's next for this industry, right? Is profiles. So we got there pretty quick, but um, Jason's like spot on with the video as an example. Um, I like to think of the profiles as kind of going from an open vocabulary where you can put anything in into this data stream. You can put anything in there, right? Uh, which I think a lot of people find very convenient, but it's kind of a disaster for interoperability, right? The uh, the profiles are a way to like layer a controlled vocabulary on top of that. So you could track video interactions. You could make up all your own data representation, put an XAPI, right? Wouldn't do anybody any good because that data wouldn't be interoperable, right? But if you follow the video profile, then that's a controlled vocabulary. You don't get to just represent play and pause in a different way if you're doing the video profile. So I think what we're going to start finding is, is like um, tools are going to have to get much more explicit about not just that we do XAPI, but we do XAPI using this standardized flavor, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, 
So the whole interoperability, right? And you guys, uh, for the audience, you keep hearing this word interoperable, right? Meaning that you're able to communicate with other entities, not just the one that you have the data with. There's a couple of problems I see in the industry on this guys. One is, um, I think LMS vendors are just gonna get in the way of all of it, right? Because it's threatening their, their product. But the second piece is that um, I see, well, and because of that, I see some things that are kind of like mediating, you know, that issue, right? So isn't CMI5 one of those? Yeah. So it's like a it's like a like a little band-aid thing, like a transition, like, oh no, we don't know, you don't want to do a whole exit. We're just gonna do a CMI five. So it could be my anger translator between <laughs> and everything else. Yeah, yeah. So so um but CMI five does more than that as well, right? CMI five okay. also specifies a couple other bits and pieces of the architecture. Well, hold on a minute. Then. All right, all right. Why do you need CMI five if we get XAPM? Do you see the nightmare that this is gonna be in terms of trying to sell anything? I mean, when you talk to a to a L and D leader, which none of them or not many of them have any technical acumen, this is going to be a nightmare. Uh, okay, so I'm getting XAPI. I'm going to need an LRS, right? Learning a record store, right? uh -huh. and uh, my XAPI statements are going to go into my LRS. Okay, awesome. Then um, I got an LMS, and the LMS is going to use what again? CMI five? Yeah, yeah. But hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold What's going on? on? Yeah, every, okay, every slow down. Um, this is this is important, right? Like, um, I'm really on a soapbox here, Jason. I'm sorry, man. Just, just you know, just wait. Just you know, smack me down on Skype or something if you if you need me to shut up for a second. Go, go for it, man. Go um, for it. Look, hey, I believe, I believe you are, man. Go, go all the way. Yeah, okay, excellent. Um, XAPI is not a full replacement for SCORM. It mm. replaces the performance data tracking of SCORM. It's the SCORM does a lot more than just tracking completions. It does packaging, right? There's a way to zip up a file into a course. That's like a SCORM Se thing. Right? Sequencing. Does sequencing. sequencing. Yep. That's exactly, there's a way for you to say, after I complete this, and by the way, this is the definition of complete, right? 70%, right. 60%, whatever. After I complete it, then go to this next piece of content, right? XAPI doesn't do any of that stuff. Well, it is amazing that you are telling me that, you know, I think what you're describing is multi-scope, right? Multi-scope yeah. sequencing? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and what that means, guys, is that you, <laughs> well, for any of those of you that do storyline development, forget about it, because there's no multi-scope there, but um, for the for the captivators, <laughs> there is multi-scope. The problem is finding an LMS that supports all of that. Well, so, so I mean, not only is support I mean, for you can do all that, but the other, what LMS is really doing? I don't, I haven't seen one yet. So I don't know, like, like I'm not, I'm not really an LMS guy, so I can't tell you who does this, right? Who supports sequencing properly? I don't know, right? Um, I will say though that these entire concepts, and it's not. Look, I, I don't want to go into sequencing because there's other topics too. There's oh, there, right, right, right. save resume, right? Uh -huh. Like save resume is like a service that an LMS provides to a SCO, right? right. Um, but there's a couple of tricks there. There are me, behaviors. Hold on. Let me translate to the... To okay, the sorry, sorry. Okay. So save resume, guys. When you come back to your LMS, you come back to the course, you go back to that one same place you were at. If right. things get disconnected, all that Suspend, stuff, you get back to the same place in the course. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me yeah. about that. Well, so, 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 problem. I'm sorry. And I wanted to say there's a problem there. If you're doing 1.2, there's a limitation on the data, right? So if your yeah. course is like super heavy, on, on assets, then you end up in this never-ending loop. Yep. Uh, like cornerstone. Uh, uh, you know what happens out there. Sorry, I had to clear my throat. Swarm uh, one one dot two did not have uh, roll-up rules uh, for okay. multi-sco courses or right. sequencing. So yeah, Swarm two thousand four introduced that and addressed that problem. Well, I'm gonna give you a picture here. There's a lot of people still today doing one point two. Yep. Oh yeah. yeah. We're well aware. Uh, when I was at AD ADL, uh, we did a survey of all the DOD services to see what the adoption was of SCORM 1.2, 2004, and what, there was way more 1.2. I think it was like 70 to 30 percent or 80 wow. to 40. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this was probably eight or 10 years ago, but it was still. Yeah, I, it's still today. I mean, I, I see it everywhere. But but to bring it back around to CMI5, right? Um, yeah. 
Okay. But we're just we're we're now we're just listing all kinds of things that SCORM does that are above and beyond X API, right? That are not just data performance tracking, right? Okay. Um, and CMI five is an attempt to kind of um, add those kinds of layers, like say if resume, like um, signal the termination of a piece of content so that the LMS closes it, right? To layer those kinds of services um, on top of X API, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and it's, uh, it's so CMI5 is a profile of XAPI. We were talking about profiles earlier. Okay. But but okay. it also includes a lot of behaviors that are not really XAPI behaviors. They're instructions to an LMS. Right. Yep. Now, why, here's the question, right? Is why, well, first of all, a couple of things that I've seen because I've been an LMS administrator. Some LMS is out there uh, when the XAPI came around and the first name was Tencan and whatnot. Um, we had the, we had the, uh, we had just people putting like a, some kind of little browser button and, you know, allowing people to click and activate a statement and they call that XAPI. So, <laughs> so, you know, I guess the sales were up uh, an uptake on that one, but main issue here, guys, why? So if we're talking about all this stuff is performance tracking and when that, was this again the cost of the military? Did the military reach out to the ADA and say, "Hey, we need something more than this SCORM 2004 stuff"? Yeah, yeah. I mean, SCORM, SCORM solved a, a real problem back in the '90s. You know, okay. the military was uh, developing a lot of training content. They made the big shift from CBTs, you know, CD-based training that we're handing out, and it was a big uh, cost oh, yeah. saver just to move onto the web alone. But moving on to the web and trying to get all these courses developed, they realized we may not keep the same learning management system forever. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to keep our content forever. The content's really expensive. They invest a ton of money into developing online training. So that was the need it solved. Uh, problem it solved is, one, we need the courseware to work as a standalone uh, piece of software. We don't need all of these server side requirements. We, you know, that we, before SCORM came in, I was working for the Navy actually and helping, uh, uh, with their Navy e-learning environment. And in the early days before SCORM 1.2 was solidified, we were getting courseware in developed with, um, ASP, PHP, all these various wow. server side, each one had to have its own database set up. I mean, it was a nightmare to try to maintain and configure every single course that came in. The Navy has tens of thousands of courses in their in their learning management system, right? Yeah. So it made sense. SCORM really addressed that problem of cutting cutting down on that. So XAPI came along, and the problem it solved, as, as I mentioned earlier, when uh, ADL was researching SCORM 2.0 requirements for the DoD back in 2008 through uh, Let'sy, the the no, one of the, the number one requirement of SCORM 2.0 was to track something else besides uh, e-learning courseware in a browser. And that's all SCORM addressed was courseware in a browser. So that was that was what the requirement and that's where it came from. Uh, it did come from the services that that's okay. where XAPI is okay. born from. Yep. Yeah, yeah, but I just, I want to note the, um, it's not just the in a browser, right? It's cross domain. I know it's like a very technical thing, right? Mm -hmm, but like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Most XAPI is still in a browser, but it's it's cross domain, and that's something that SCORM never really addressed. Yeah, you can work you can work around it though. I mean, a lot of LMS implementations we had, we we worked around it, and you know, AICC, which was the mm -hmm. spec before SCORM, um, uh, what SCORM evolved into was like a a, a bigger version of AICC. Um, it it worked cross domain. Uh, you know, the things that SCORM had a lot of requirements, such as reusability, uh, besides interoperability and durability, you know, interoperability is to be able to talk to multiple systems. Durability is to be based on a technology like HTML and XML and things that are going to be around a while in JavaScript. Um, it, 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 it was using those types of things. Um, you know, that was, that was the, the premise. Yeah, I'm kind of terrified to hear that people developed courseware where the courses had server side code that just seems like a terrible idea mm, yeah well yeah. wasn't that the uh before scorm you had the uh aviation one right the a whatever a, you know what i'm talking about um a it was server based everything had to be hosted on the server and the 
data was passed back to confirm completion and going down. Like AICE or something? Yep. I can't remember yep. exactly right now. Yeah, I was just well, mentioning that a little while ago. That was going to. That's spec. again. Yeah, that was the spec that was used before. It was on, amazing. Uh, <laughs> is AICC HackP. So it used HTTP and you could communicate across domain, you know, the problem that Rob's talking about. You couldn't so much with SCORM because of the, the illities, like I was mentioning, the reusability requirement earlier required SCORM content to be standalone and in a package so that it, it could be reused. Yeah. So you could develop a lesson or a SCO that could be reused possibly as a standalone component in another package. Gotcha. So because of those inherent uh, granular reusability requirements, they kind of uh, canceled out the ability to do cross-domain uh, distributed requirements, but there were still ways to work around it. Like I said, it was just a little bit of a technical challenge and and, and you're right though, Rob, out of the box, uh, no, that did not work cross-domain. Well, and I mean, we got, I wanna say, Rob, let me call you for a second. We got a little bit of time left. Uh, and I wanna kid you guys with a question here that it's probably a very good one to discuss. So I see a lot of things that, you know, as I observe, I, you know, with the Rustaceans, the, the, the SCORM cloud was, to me, probably the best LMS there ever was. However, it didn't have the organizational structure behind it to allow you to do hierarchy of users and things like that, right? So I don't understand why that never happened, because that would have killed pretty much any LMS out there. It, it was so good. I mean, it's still good. People, I use it for testing. People use it for testing. You know? Yeah. Now, uh, we, we used Rust to see SCORM engine uh, when I was working for the Navy years ago in their e-learning initiative. And uh, just like you were talking about earlier, Alex, none of the LMSs could uh, implement SCORM very well, especially when sequencing came around, because it is extremely complex yeah. uh, because of the verbosity of the XML. Uh, being used to create the, the sequencing rules, uh, the processing time was enormous, and a lot of LMSs just couldn't create a really performant uh, rendering of those rules in a browser. They couldn't uh, couldn't couldn't translate into very performant um, experience. So uh, you know, Rustic came in and filled that gap and created this uh, SCORM engine. So the LMSs wouldn't have to focus on implementing SCORM. And uh, it, it was very, very successful from what I, I could tell. And then the SCORM yeah. cloud, like you're talking about, was more for, hey, uh, if you want to test your SCORM content, right. uh, come, come and check out this testing uh, alternative to the ADL test suite. Um, so what about, what about the exit BI then? Besides the tracking stuff, I think one of the biggest advantages over LMSs is reporting, right? The graphical displays that you see on the LRSs. When the LRSs have such a beautiful, including the Veracity LRS, which you guys, uh, you know, you may, I believe you made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, isn't that a true? I mean, because that's been the, always the biggest frustration in any LMS. They want to give you a CSV and then figure it out. Here's your reporting. Right, okay? right, right, right. And I mean, it's not that it would be impossible to have an LMS with pretty dashboards. You totally could, right? But yeah. I mean, you're never, I mean, LMS has so many responsibilities. They're never going to be able to spend all their developer hours building a dashboard platform, right? Okay. I mean, that's one of the reasons to disaggregate these services. You have one service for tracking and analyzing data, one service for delivering content to users. There's, there's no reason that the same piece of software should be responsible for both of those roles. That's, I mean, that's why we, we write the software we write, right? Like, okay. we're very hesitant to, like, branch our product out to become an LMS because like we don't want we don't want to be an LMS. We want to spend all our time focusing on data analytics. Um, but at the same time, if we were an LMS and we were like an integrated solution, you know, kind of a one-stop shop, we wouldn't have time to do such a good job with data analytics. Okay. Well, guys, hey, this has been an amazing episode. I, I mean, I know we can go for hours here. So, I think so yeah. I want to thank you, Jason Hag. I want to thank you, Rob Chadwick. Uh, guys, check out the links below. This has been another episode off the cuff. We'll catch you in the next one. Hey there, do you like this episode? You'd like to see a lot more? Go ahead and click on that subscribe button and also make sure you turn on notifications. You'll know exactly when we put out our weekly episode of Off the Cuff. So stay true guys and uh, reach out anytime you like.